I've been with the firm now, uh, this is my seventh year, and I lead our physician advisory group, which really deals with all things uh, physician or provider and hospital relationships, everything from your provider contracts to practice and imp uh, performance improvement to medical staff development planning. I'm joined today with the newest member of Stroudwater, Kirsten Meisterling, uh, who is a consultant at Stroudwater, and I'll let Kirsten introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kirsten, as Opal just mentioned. I am the most recent consultant here at Stroudwater, and one of my main focuses at Stroudwater is working in the physician hospital alignment, compensation, and practice improvement space. Uh, my expertise and background is actually in employee benefits. I've worked with many organizations over the years, primarily hospitals, health systems, and higher education institutions to develop and manage their employee benefit programs and meet their organizational objectives around recruitment, retention, and financial sustainability. In my work in provider compensation and performance improvement at Stroudwater, I'm looking forward to bringing this experience to the forefront. Provider total rewards and employer-sponsored benefits are often overlooked as organizations consider their compensation strategies and compliance, and we, we believe that there's a compelling reason for organizations to fold employee benefits into those conversations and strategies. And we're looking forward today to sharing our point of view um, around this area. Thanks, Opal. Thanks, Kirsten. So today we feel like this topic is of absolute importance given what everybody has been going through across their different health organizations. Everything from physician burnout, significant number of physicians accelerating their retirement, as well as we have had the impacts of COVID and to, from a remuneration standpoint, as well as changes in the Stark regulations and CMS changes. All of these things combined, when you think about your provider and hospital alignment, are important factors to consider to what, and going forward. What do you do to make sure you have a strong physician alignment in your organization currently and something that will work in the future in a way that is really financially sustainable for your organization and regulatorily compliant? So today we are going to talk about what's been going on with physician compensation and the regulations that are impacting that, as well as what the impacts of the things, the events over the past 18 months have been impacting these, as well as letting you guys know some of the, our recommendations that we've been working with with clients to address these different issues. So starting off with regards to the regulations, and I'm sure, I guess I could have added, I am a JD, but this is not legal advice for anyone, but as a lawyer, I can't help but go over some of the regulations from that standpoint. And really, the reason why we think about this is regardless of what the regulations are, Physician spend is a significant component of any or healthcare organization's expense. With hospitals, the physician loan expenditure is 5 to 10% of your net patient service revenue, and it's growing in every single year. I would point out that this is truly just the physician expenditure. It doesn't include advanced practice providers. Stroudwater has significant experience working with uh, rural and sole community providers, where we're seeing that number actually expand greatly, primarily because of the high utilization of APPs and the reliance of those APPs to be able to provide healthcare services across their healthcare spectrum. One of the things that we point out is that physician expenditure, when you look at that, and if you start doing the math for your own organization, is that this information is not just captured into the salaries and benefits line for most organizations. When you look at your financial and operating uh, statements, oftentimes, the actual cost of your provider expenditures is scattered throughout the uh, throughout the P&L. It might show up in salaries as a significant part of it, but oftentimes that, for most organizations, that reflects only your employed providers. You might have professional service agreements or locum expenses that end up under professional fees or contract arrangements in another part of the P&L. We've seen expenditures associated with quality payments or medical directorships for providers that end up in other areas of the P&L. And so understanding what your true physician expenditure is, recognizing that for most organizations, this total expenditure well exceeds what their operating margin is. And so being able to pay attention to this and monitor this actual physician spend is absolutely critical for the, for the financial health and success of an organization. As I mentioned from a regulatory standpoint, we have to make sure we are being compliant with the Stark requirements. Most people are familiar with Stark, 
and if we're paying attention to, oh, Stark made some significant changes this year. But realistically, when it comes to Stark, what we're talking about is, is your compensation within fair market value with, the, of course, that market being flexible based off of what's happening nationally, what's happening in your, are you in the Midwest, the Northeast, your specific state, and your local markets? And how that might be impacted based off of what specifically organizationally you're looking at for a specific specialty. For example, where you recruit from may impact what your market, uh, what the fair market value is. If you are in a larger city, I'm, I'm based here in Nashville, Tennessee, where there's an abundance of family medicine providers, that might be a significant market to look at as far as what is Nashville paying for a family medicine physician. However, if I am looking for a pediatric oncologist, there's not nearly as many of them, and we're talking about a more national market. So paying attention to what is the fair market value for your specific market is absolutely critical to make sure you're in compliance with Stark. Then there's the question of commercial reasonableness. And oftentimes people are saying, okay, is it commercially reasonable to lose money on a provider contract? And the OIG has said, yes, it is reasonable, as long as you can understand what is the justification for that. Does it actually overall make sense? And one of the key things as to whether or not it makes sense is how financially sustainable is it? How far are you digging yourself into the ground? And do you align yourself with your providers and your compensation in a way that marries moving the organization forward financially with how you are compensating the provider? And of course, the big one is people, when they think of Stark, is to make sure how does the remuneration relate to the volume or the value of the referrals of the provider, because that's where the big no-no is from Stark. However, the Stark changes have come in to actually open the gates for how we consider volume and value, and now allowing for contracts and compensation arrangements that allow you to have, require providers to have, say, in-network referrals but as long as you don't directly tie the compensation to those in-network referrals. You may, however, tie it to a percentage of saying, hey, my providers need to refer at least 70% of available services that we provide at our hospital to be able to, you know, provide those services they need to refer in network. However, you cannot interfere with patient preference or medical necessity in making those requirements. So being very clear in your uh, contracts as to how you are treating that and making sure you are start compliant is absolutely critical. Why is it so important? Because it's too expensive not to be, frankly. We've heard about different Stark and anti-kickback violations causing people significant sums of money. Everybody hears about the big cases that have happened in that are hundreds of millions of dollars with the large systems, you know, whether it's the Toomey case or the Halifax case. And they think, oh, well, that's not going to happen to me. I'm a smaller hospital, and I don't need to really worry about this. The OIG is never going to come after me. The answer is that's not necessarily true. Um, for at least since 2017, the OIG said that they are going to be expanding their efforts to make sure that they are paying attention to violations of Stark and anti-kickback in all areas of healthcare, and not just the large systems. It's not just about going after deep pockets. As I said, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, Cookville Medical Center up in Cookville, Tennessee, which is about an hour and a half from where I live. Small, you know, not a tiny hospital by any means, but a small, definitely smaller than what people think of when they think of Stark and anti-kickback violations. Had to pay $4.1 million last year right as COVID was starting to get hit because of a technical violation that they had with regards to the Stark and anti-kickback laws. The ones that I have listed on here, the reason why I draw attention to this is the vast majority of the organizations that have issues with Stark and NIXFET, it's not intentional. People are not, there's no emails out there where it's red flag of saying, hey, we need to pay this physician so that he'll refer X, you know, he's worth $10 million to our organization in referrals. That's oftentimes not what is happening. What is happening is technical violations of people not doing the appropriate, having compliance programs in place, not doing the appropriate documentation, who are people who are overly relying on survey information and saying, well, we'll just follow MGMA without doing any sort of analysis as to is it appropriate for your organization and for that physician. So recognizing that the cost of compliance on this, I know that some people look at it as they check the box kind of thing, it's too expensive not to. 
from that standpoint, especially when it is not required to have the intent to violate the regulations in order to get in trouble with this. So that being said, you know, we think about, well, how, well, how would I get in trouble from this standpoint? Realistically, the number one thing we still see is that it, these comes forward with a whistleblower, whether it's a physician or a CFO or the two most common who have left the organization and say, by the way, you might want to go check and look into this. So that being said, while that is the most common way that we have it, and we also have competing hospitals, especially if you have two organizations that are trying to go after a single, maybe it's trying to acquire a physician group, and one hospital goes and gets a fair market valuation done for what they can pay for that, and they find out that they were significantly outbid and wonder how could that be in compliance with fair market value, they might be a whistleblower. Increasingly though, patient complaints are coming into play here with regards to your compliance. So with patients coming up and having more transparency, patients engaging in their healthcare at an increasing rate, we're starting to see an increased number of patient complaints about an organization. I feel like there's no way this could be right. And they flag it, especially if they have an issue with their bill. And you would think, well, what does billing have to do with physician compensation? Is if, if you have a significant number of patients who are complaining about the billing doesn't seem to be right, and what it does is trigger a red flag to the OIG, a billing audit can expand the review to incorporate compensation. So that is one of the things that can cause an organization to end up having an audit that allows them to see into your remuneration and whether or not you're being compliant with Stark and anti-kickback regulations. So that goes from both making sure your revenue cycle management is on point, but also uh, your, your patient engagement is on point, but also making sure that you're dotting all your I's and crossing your T's and doing what you need to from a compliance standpoint of compensation. So the things that we look at in determining whether or not we are being compliant with fair market value, as I mentioned, is, okay, what are we paying for? And there's both the physician or the provider and the position is the way I look at it. And you, when you think about it, okay, I need a general surgeon. So that's great. Here's what the position is. It has its duties and responsibilities. I have a community need that says I need X number of general surgeons compared to what I actually have. Here's how having general surgery will benefit the community. It's going to take me 400 days to recruit a physician. There's not a ton of pool out there. I am going to uh, look at exactly for any general surgeon, you know, I need somebody who has this many years of experience and how this compares to some survey data, data such as MDMA. That's the position. However, there's also the physician itself. Am I recruiting a general surgeon who has 20 years of experience from the military who's going to be very, who is used to doing trauma surgery and in, in a low resource environment and so recruiting them to my rural hospital will allow me to actually have a broader general surgery program than I would otherwise versus am I recruiting a general surgeon who is right out of fellowship who frankly has been able to call it you know from a large city where they've been able to call up a specialist for anything that's not truly general surgery from that standpoint which what's going to fit my needs better Am I going to have somebody who has years of research experience and is going to bring the most advanced and newest um, robotic technologies and skill sets with them, and they're going to train my staff? So taking all those pieces into consideration when you consider fair market value, it's not just simply survey says, I can pay median, here's median because I need one physician. It is what is going to be the full scope of their work and what can they personally bring to the table to determine their compensation. And recognizing you have to take, especially with community need, where, where does my community actually fit compared to where I may be recruiting from? Do I have a significant need for call, from a call coverage standpoint, where this provider is going to have a higher call rate? Or do I have a high disease incidence rate where I'm going to have to have this provider manage a specific type of population that maybe they wouldn't otherwise? So making sure you know all of those different pieces Understanding it goes well beyond just a matter of what the survey say, right? When we look at our organizations, we think about, okay, well, what is physician remuneration? A lot of organizations we work with are very familiar with some sort of annual guarantee. Here's my starting base salary, or here's just the salary that the physicians have. 
Most organizations have moved to where they have productivity incentives. Most common is compensation per work RVU. We still see some organizations that are under the old model of percentage of net patient service revenue or gross charges. So we're seeing organizations successfully move into more compensation per visit when it comes to primary care providers. For compensation that is incentivized based off of panel size, because we're part of an ACO and we're having to monitor actually a person's whole health and we're looking at this panel from a population health management standpoint. If you have a rural health clinic, one thing I would recommend is if you are looking at potentially doing compensation per visit, is considering how do you treat visits overall versus rural health clinic qualifying visits. A key distinction there is I would like to say, I don't pay for what I don't get paid for. So if the organization's own reimbursement and where your reimbursement is going is not aligned with your overall provider compensation, then you're at risk for, frankly, unhappiness across the organization. You're at a higher risk that uh, the C-suite might be saying, hey, physicians, we need you to do more. This isn't, you know, this, you're costing us money. And physicians saying, I can't, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing to my knowledge, and you're not telling me what direction we're trying to go in. Or you want me to go in this direction, but that's not how you pay me. Increasingly, organizations that are moving across that spectrum from paying for fee-for-service to a value-based model are starting to try to incorporate value-based compensation into their compensation co agreements with the physicians, whether that's distribution of ACO dollars, potentially value-based reimbursement adjustments to the work RVU rate, or having overall quality payments. I think quality payments right now, even though right now they still make up a very small percentage of overall co physician compensation, they are increasing. Most of them have historically been bonus-based. If you may receive up to X dollars for hitting these quality metrics. Increasingly though, we're starting to see and encouraging people to consider putting those at risk if the organization is already under risk-based contracts, where the provider cannot is not just, hey, you get a bonus if you achieve this, but you could potentially have a downward adjustment if you are not helping the organization forward. And the last piece of um, compensation that we see that's very common are related to administrative and academic duties. So most of you are very familiar with medical directorships, you might have a medical director for each individual service line. Oftentimes that is a specific stipend. My caution with medical directorship is to make sure that, you know, it's not just a time card where you're making sure that the physician is saying, I'm spending so much hours on medical directorships. It's outlining what are the responsibilities of the medical director within the organization's agreement that they have, making sure those are well documented, and reviewing those duties on an annual basis, saying, okay, does this make sense going forward? How has my organization changed where I may need to adjust this so that the physician is now responsible for moving growth in family care, family practice care forward? You may have APP or resident supervision, or for those who are in an academic medical center, you know, a faculty position or research grants as well that are incorporated in their remuneration. If you do have providers who are getting compensation for supervision, make sure it is appropriate for what they are supervising and that you're not double dipping. If you are paying a stipend for APP or resident supervision to a provider and say it's like, hey, I can review up to five nurse practitioners, make sure it is, it is consistent with whatever is in your collaborative agreement, that they are paying attention to what is in that collaborative agreement if you are in a restricted or reduced practice state. But don't double dip in the sense of I've also seen organizations that rather than the stipend, they allow themselves to have get credit for part of the work RVUs that the APP might be providing or the resident may be providing. You can't do both. Make sure that you are very careful and diligent in reviewing how you pay for those specific provisions to make sure you don't end up in a technical violation and overpaying. So that being said, so I would like Kirsten to talk a little bit more about what goes beyond what I just talked about in those contracts. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Opal. So organizations typically just think about compensation, quote unquote, or cash compensation when they're considering whether or not what they pay their physicians and other providers if it's within fair market value. But fair market value considers not just cash compensation. It's any benefits, cash or in-kind, and that means employee benefits as well. 
Um, and oftentimes organizations won't consider employee benefits in their fair market value opinions. Um, and they may not consider it from an employee, uh, excuse me, a competitive, competitiveness standpoint when they're attracting and retaining their provider workforce. Um, so what are we thinking about when we talk about the distinguishing factors between cash compensation and benefits? Cash compensation is really all of the items that Opal just mentioned, base salary, sign bonus, extension bonus, so on and so forth. And a good fair market value will look at all of these various elements. Um, Opal and I have run into client situations where we ask for their compensation because we are putting together a fair market value opinion and they'll inadvertently exclude certain uh, cash compensations that just don't readily come to mind, such as we provided a signing bonus when we first hired this physician, um, or the physician also gets credit for APP productivity. Um, a good fair market value opinion needs to consider all of these various cash compensation elements through the lens of stack stackable compensation. In addition to that is the employee benefits piece of this. So the items listed on the right are kind of the full scope of employee benefits that, that often come to mind that are often employer sponsored. The most significant uh, competitive uh, levers, if you will, and cost, um, costly benefits include health insurance, retirement contributions, and continuing education. Physicians will often have the same or similar benefits in many of these areas, especially health insurance, um, because you don't want to run afoul of anti-discrimination concerns. <clears throat> However, these, these benefits are extremely costly for organizations and provide a tremendous amount of value. Um, Opal and I recently ran into an organization who is providing first dollar, uh, zero dollar paycheck <laughs> health insurance coverage to their provider workforce workforce on top of extremely generous cash compensation. So we're suspecting that they're going to have an issue of stackable compensation being above fair market value because of their generous employee benefits and also their generous cash compensation. Um, but many organizations might find themselves in, in the opposite seat where they might provide benefits that are below market value. And if cash compensation and all else is the same between two uh, hospitals or employment options for a provider, the richness of an employee benefits plan can be an important tool in retracting physicians and providers to your organization. Next slide, Opal. So what do we recommend looking at when assesses, assessing your total remuner, remuneration, I will call it rewards, uh, program? We typically like to look at this in three different buckets, if you will, competitiveness, compliance, and cost effectiveness. Obviously, cost effectiveness is extremely important. Benefits are typically the number two operating expense for an organization, and they increase at a rate much higher than salaries and benefits driven by health insurance. However, for the purposes of today's conversation, we'll focus on competitiveness and compliance. And when we help organizations look through these two lenses, what we like to do is benchmark against industry and regional specific peers and competitors. So industry specific, obviously hospitals and clinics from a regional standpoint, we'll also look at just large employers within the organization's geography. To the extent you're part of a system that maybe does not have harmonized benefits, we would also like to look at what other uh, hospitals or provider groups in the system offer to their providers and employees more broadly. A competitiveness uh, benchmarking assessment answers the questions around what are your peers and competitors offering? Um, are they offering signing bonuses and more generous health insurance, so on and so forth. And how does, more importantly, really, how does your organization's total reward, rewards fall relative to peers and competitors? And that can be kind of hard to assess sometimes. Um, from a cash compensation perspective, it's really easy to add up all of the uh, cash compensation that's provided to uh, 
a provider and compare that to a survey, but it gets a bit more tricky when you're looking at employee benefits, when you have multiple different programs, retirement, health insurance, um, and, and more uh, nuanced, if you will, um, designs in those programs. So we'll share with you an example of, of how we like to quantify the program for a client. So this is a client example. Um, this client has over 10 provider clinics. Um, they engage Droughtwater to help them with not only their, not only their compensation strategy, but also provide um, practice improvement uh, from a financial and operational perspective. And as a part of the compensation strategy, what we wanted to assess was not only the cash compensation and how they aligned with their peers, the hospital peer group, but also their employee benefits. So the table on the top shows you an average family medicine's total rewards, including cash, medical, retirement, and all other benefits relative to that peer group. And what we found is that this um, client in particular was 23% below the median. Um, so this is below the 25th percentile and it really was not aligned with their organizational goals and objectives, which are to pay fairly based on productivity and more in line with the 50th percentile. And you'll see at the bottom that one of the components that's influencing this, this positioning relative to benchmark is that their employee benefits from an employer-sponsored perspective, what the employer actually pays are below that middle, that middle bar, which shows you the hospital peer by a pretty significant margin. Um, on the next slide, what we show is the flip of this, which is the employee, the employee, the efficient physician or the EPP's perspective. Um, so this chart looks at not only the medical insurance, their paycheck costs, so what the the physician pays from, from their paycheck, as well as the out-of-pocket costs. So when they see a provider and they pay a copay, the deductibles, out-of-pocket maximum. Um, and then the, the orange stars or diamonds show the employer's retirement contribution value. What we've done is compared the client, whether or not it's a physician who's just enrolling themselves in the health insurance plan, or a physician who's rolling their family, for example, in a plan relative to the peer group. And what you'll see is, for example, if you look at the EE, which stands for employee only, you'll see that, yes, the health insurance plan may cost an individual a little bit less. This group actually charges nothing out of paycheck for this plan. Um, but when you look at the total value relative to the peer of the health insurance and the retirement program, there's a significant gap, primarily driven by the retirement here. So in situations where all else is equal, cash compensation is the same, um, the work's the same, et cetera, employee benefits can, can make a significant difference in an organization's um, overall strategy. So next steps for, for this client were to um, really just think about their total rewards from a holistic perspective, thinking through the compensation and the benefits component as well. Thanks, Kirsten. So the other thing that is making this topic incredibly relevant today is obviously CMS in, on this back in December 2nd decided to shake things up, um, which I mean, some of us were a little bit more prepared because we were paying attention to the proposed rule in October, but many of our organizations were busy with a little thing called COVID. And so CMS's uh, change on December 2nd for the physician fee schedule was significant. Um, this is one of the biggest overhaul that CMS has had since 2007, where it was really targeting the outpatient evaluation and management codes for patients and retitrating the work RVU value for the first time again since 2007. It was a significant revision where the changes that were done were with the intent of recognizing that there's a significant documentation for non physicians and that the previous work RV values probably undervalued the amount of time and effort involved in these services. This is probably not surprising to hospital organizations who have been hearing their physicians complain about EHR systems for years 
but also the coding requirements of saying I'm required to, you know, list out all of these multi-system checks on my documentation. And I might have somebody who has, you know, a two system check versus a five system check, but it ends up being coded the same. And I get the same credit as a physician on my work RVUs from that standpoint, but the documentation is significant. And so CMS made a significant revision for this to try to take that into consideration. The fact, the importance as we move to outcomes-based healthcare and focusing on, on population health, that, you know, performance history, understanding what is medically appropriate from that documentation and looking at the whole person is where the or where healthcare would like to go from that standpoint and making sure that our work rv values take into consideration from that from that perspective in addition cms recognized that the 99201 code has been primarily used for nurse visits and that is that is completely appropriate but which means we need to stop having physicians document the 99201 enn code that being said, the, there, there's a huge impact from doing so. So when we looked at it from a utilization perspective of how frequently the most the, these ENM codes were used, when we think about what is the difference in actually for the work RV use on a weighted average value, we're talking about a 35.8% increase. If you just look at how these codes are utilized, that is significant. If you pay your physician on a compensation per work RVU methodology, I don't think anybody had the, has the budget to say we're gonna have a 35.8% change in compensation next year. Um, most organizations deal with frankly single digit, maybe one and a half to 4% increases in their compensation when they think about it from an annual basis. Definitely not 35.8%. And that being said, you know, using the, the um, MGMA's data dive procedural profile, we were able to go through and, um, you know, and with our friends over at Gallagher, look at exactly what is the impact for the different specialties because there's different utilization of these codes. Not surprisingly, our specialists who rely on their work RVUs coming more for the surgical and hospital based codes aren't going to be impacted nearly as much. Maybe for general surgery, your normal standard annual increase of 3% was appropriately budgeted. But as we see in our family medicine and our primary care practices, which were the intent of CMS was to give better credit to primary care providers for the work that they do, you see significant changes. Urgent care medicine, family medicine, and internal medicine, nearly 20, you know, on an average, we're seeing organizations were thinking about increases in compensation of up to 20% if they bill for the exact same codes as last year, just from the change in work RVUs. So with us doing a lot of work with rural and soul community um, hospitals, the, the ones that I have highlighted in orange here are the ones that we see most frequently for those organizations. And so those organizations really, frankly, if you look at it, had a huge hit potentially on their compensation depending on where they are. So that raises the question, why should I be paying for work RVUs? Why should I pay it based off of work RVUs if I could have this kind of change happening significantly? Well, when it comes to primary care, this exactly is part of the reason why we've encouraged on a primary care perspective and recognizing the shift of looking and having to do multi-system checks and treat the whole patient as opposed to just the presenting problem as part of the reason why some organizations we've been working with them to transform their compensation to be recognizing primary care and specialty care probably don't need to be paid the same way maybe it's about patient panel management maybe it's about on a, a rural health clinic qualifying visit rather than specifically work our views it was because cms was frankly behind the times as far as how do we pay for it knowing that you generate work our views frankly in surgery and that's what generates the highest amount of work RVUs as opposed to your general patient visits in the office. On top of that, so organizations are like, especially talking to their physicians of, we're gonna have increases in work RVUs of potentially 35.8%. On top of that, we did not have commensurate compensation or reimbursement change for the hospitals themselves. It's not a matter of revenue was able to just completely offset the increases in work RVUs. For the first time, actually, the conversion factor had a significant decrease. Um, however, we had the Consolidation Appropriation Act 
there was a lot of lobbying that went off to actually hold off on that actually the decrease for 2020 that it's going to be held until 20, 2021. So we have a slight increase. But you see that increase of 3.75%. It's nowhere near what the increase is in the work RV years. So one of the clients we were working for was working at the PSA arrangement between a hospital system and a large uh, primary care group. Very successful primary care group that was in the community. And the hospital under their PSA paid them a PSA rate of a compensation basically per work RV for them to run their practice and to be able to provide care. This organization did not have nearly the hit in, co uh, in 2020 as for COVID as other organizations did, only a slight dip. However, when we did an examination of their work RVUs, if they build the exact same codes in 2021 as they did in 2020, you see that there's going to be, they were going to jump up to almost 73,000 work RVUs from where they were from 60,000. So, I mean, a significant change in work RVUs that was gonna cost the hospital a significant amount of money, even though they were going to get an expected revenue increase, right? Now, this is great for that practice where they would have had additional money, but realistically, the hospital knew that they could, it would not be sustainable for them to pay out this PSA exactly as it was written. If you're in a similar situation where you're looking at this, keep in mind, this organization did not get nearly as hit by COVID in 2020. So a comparison of 2020 to 2021 is probably accurate for them. Other organizations, when they do this, they're like, okay, 2020 was a slump. If you compare 2021 projections to actually where were they in 2019, it might be an even bigger hit than what um, than the example that we're showing here. So what we did for this organization, we were working on behalf of um, the primary care group where the hospital was insisting on, hey, we can't afford this. We're proposing to reduce the per work RVU rate from $98 to $80. So from that standpoint, the provider said, wait a minute, we will actually lose more, we will lose money on this agreement if we do. So they had the option of, hey, do we take the proposed agreement from the hospital? Do we terminate the agreement? You know, where are we from a negotiation standpoint and how do we look at it? The way that we looked at it from a Stroudwater perspective was how do we get to a break even zero impact for the hospital? And recognizing that realistically with this additional, you know, the added increase in revenue, that let's split the difference. And rather than having it all go to the hospital or all go to the practice, being fair partners, why don't we split the difference? And so under the amended contract, we negotiated to basically have an $85 per work RVU rate where both organizations benefited and the hospital did not have the significant impact that they were expecting. Uh, from the additional changes, the original changes in the work RV. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, a lot of the, the Stark rules have just have changed recently. I would say from a evaluator perspective, these were not as significant as I think some people were expecting, mainly because when we think about it, a lot of these um, changes were things that you could figure, they weren't explicit exceptions or specific safe harbors under Stark but there were creative ways to getting them. So I will say the lawyer and me will say you took away some, instead of taking away some of our loopholes, you made it easier to tap into some of them um, as far as paying attention to your uh, direct referrals and having in-network referrals that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, the important thing is to pay attention to, uh, we became explicit as to when it doesn't apply, right? You can't be able to do direct referrals um, and have compensation associated with that if it's, it's um, incongruent with patient preference or if it's incongruent with the patient's insurer has an actual specific um, in-network versus out-of-network providers. Or of course, as oh, this one has always existed, about if it's not in the patient's best medical interest from that standpoint. So the goal of these were actually to create uh, um, better arrangements for those who are thinking about value-based entities and how do we pay for that kind of performance and making it easier and clearer that people were able to pay for this in a way that things that would be compliant. Um, you still have to, as I mentioned, be cautionary as to how you apply that formula where you can't pay directly for saying, pay for every referral you make, you get X dollars. However, one of the things you can do now is you could create a bonus pool 
where the pool funding is based on what the value of the referral, referrals are. So this is where I was talking about from a percentage of if you refer 70% of appropriate patients in network and that creates X value, then we will create a bonus pool that the physician gets paid out of. So you can see how that's indirect compensation associated with referrals that falls within the new safe, shark, um, safe harbors. One thing though that CMS has now said very expressly that people have used historically, I keep on saying people rely on survey says, CMS has said you cannot say survey says and therefore it's fair market value. Because, and, and part of that is, frankly, a lot of people use the surveys inappropriately. They don't read the full survey, they don't understand how the information was gathered, and they're applying apples to oranges. For example, you have organizations that say the MGMA median compensation for work our VU is $50. However, they don't take into consideration the inverse relationship between productivity and, comp and compensation for work our VU. So you have a highly productive provider that you pay median level comp per work RVU, you, and you end up with compensation above the 90th percentile. So if you see outcomes such as that, and you would say, well, a survey says I could pay this comp per work RVU, that's inaccurate. And so we were seeing a lot of that happen, and so it's not surprising that CMS has finally said, if you rely only on surveys as your defense of saying something's within fair market value, then the presumption is that uh, you're, you need better documentation to, than that. You cannot just say our compensation policy is everybody starts at the 60th percentile and we evaluate after that. So just be careful. I'm not saying every single provider needs a fair market value report. Usually our best practices, if you have a provider where their productivity and their compensation have a variance of greater than 20%, you probably do need a fair market value report. And understanding the whole context of how you are paying that provider, including their benefits and what the competition is. One thing we hadn't mentioned was that the, comp um, the competition is not just hospitals and health systems anymore. There, a lot of you are familiar with Walmart is employing physicians, so are the insurance companies. And so looking at it from a broader perspective of making sure those are within fair market value. The other thing that hit us is COVID from that standpoint. When we think about how COVID has impacted compensation for providers, a lot of providers got hit last year. If you were on a productivity base and you suspended surgery, then there was significant issues for those providers who had reduced compensation. A lot of organizations wanting to maintain very healthy hospital physician alignment said, we're gonna keep you whole. And underneath the stark blanket waivers that were passed associated with COVID, that was perfectly fine. There were a lot of things that people provided, such as free services, hotels for their physicians to stay at so they didn't have to bring COVID exposure home to their families, you know, daycare, meals, other types of payment. Those were covered under the stark blanket waivers. However, make sure you documented them appropriately because that document, the blanket waiver, didn't mean you didn't have to document. It just said if you did pay for it and you documented how it was related to COVID, you would be fine. You would be exempt um, from whether or not it was within a fair market value from that standpoint. However, the consequence of having these significant financial losses and having physicians have a serious uh, reduction in income last year means that you're having more organizations think about what they're going to have to do about their provider recruitment going forward and provider retention. So from that standpoint, physicians are asking for different things than they've had in the past, such as access to mental health services. They're gonna be paying more attention to what their call burden is after being burned out from this year. So understanding how exactly did COVID impact your compensation overall is an important thing to evaluate from a overall organization hospital and physician alignment strategy. That being said, when I mentioned provider recruitment and retention, looking at this, the fact that we're at 37% of physicians would like to retire in the next year, regardless of age. Basically, if they can financially figure out how to do it, there are a huge number of physicians who are considering retiring that definitely were not in that position beforehand. This is significant, especially when what your strategy might have been, you might have had a five-year medical staff development plan where you weren't planning to recruit for that position for another two or three years. So you need to be having the updated conversations with your physicians 
about what their retirement plans are and how COVID might have impacted that. We also have um, most organizations, 30% of them have lost one or more physicians. People are recognizing that maybe they want to go back to living, living closer to where their families are from that standpoint. And so we have organizations, you know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of turnover. And with physician burnout didn't start with COVID, but COVID definitely exacerbated the issue um, as being uh, problematic and something that people, more people are going to be asking for more flexible work schedules. And so how are you going to continue your patient access in that organ, that situation? On top of that, physicians are now more disengaged than ever. We are understanding which organization did the physicians feel like the organization had their back during COVID versus who did not. There are plenty of physicians out there who said, I, ne I look at my organization completely differently now based on how they treated me during COVID and whether or not I felt like they were looking out for me, were they, do it, were they engaging with me, were they actually having me participate in how we should move forward, or was it highly directive and saying here, you know, treating me like a cog in the wheel? If you were an organization that treated their physicians like a cog in the wheel, you have some damage control to do from that engagement because that lack of engagement will hit you in so many different places from that standpoint. Everything from um, physician retention and those kinds of conversations to driving things organizationally forward. And it's not just about compensation. As you can see here, you know, only. I know it's still a large number, but you know, 32% said there was lack of respect and, and concerns about insufficient compensation. More organizations, it was the bigger issue was the lack of, hey, where are we from operational metrics and what are we looking at? And how are we going to right the ship? Make sure it's going in the right direction now. If you're not having those conversations with your physicians, it's going to have a significant um, retention issue. So when we think about disengagement and what's going to happen with that, right, we think about we have reduced supply. We already had a, a national shortage on physicians. Demand's going to go up from that standpoint, which means the cost, the total remuneration is going to go up. From that standpoint, we have reduced practice performance. We're going to have bigger losses in our practices. Before the you know, median level losses in primary care were something like $115,000 per provider. And we're going to see that number grow in the, in the meantime. And, you know, when physicians are not engaged, we actually also have reduced quality of care. They're not as engaged with working with their patients. Patients are unsatisfied because they can't get in to see the physician that they want. And so it ends up in this terrible cycle. And we have to be right now, the focus needs to be, how do we break this cycle that we are potentially on this wheel? And it's gonna be key that physician engagement is the starting point. I know this conversation has been a lot about compensation and fair market value, but realistically, we look at it as a driver of physician engagement and strengthening that alignment and recognizing that yes, you have to be compliant, yes, you have to be competitive, but how does this overall fit into this larger wheel of provider engagement and having that really strong alignment with your providers? So what can you do, right? There are short-term solutions. Those of you who are paying attention to CMS, some people said we're just, you know, we can't deal with this right now. We're gonna use 2020 for this year and we'll figure it out later. Kick the can down the road. A lot of people did it with MACRA. They think they can do this with this. You can't kick the, road down, the can down the road forever. Some people are saying we're gonna do it as a partial year. Our point is you need to pay attention to it and you need to make changes. Um, the best way, in our opinion, of doing that is to being paying attention to your total remuneration. What levers do you have to pull? Can you adjust the productivity incentives or the work RV thresholds appropriately so that you're not getting hit with a 38.5% um, increase in compensation? Where do you balance it out? And, and making sure, are you engaging with your physicians about that conversation? Is it a matter of being directive? Or do you have a compensation committee, a physician action council, a physician strategy group that the providers are members of that they can participate in that engagement and be part of that conversation and help them and engaging with them about the financials because they know that the organization has to be financially viable or nobody gives compensation. Physicians are not unreasonable by any means from that standpoint, 
but you go a lot further in your alignment strategy if you have a conversation with them and provide education rather than being overly directive. And then we have to think about the future. This is not the first time CMS has made a change. This is not the first time there's been changes in start. This is, you know, for most of us, this is the first thing similar to COVID in our lifetimes, but we're going to have ha things happen in the future. So how do these types of things impact us from a larger total remuneration plan? How are we thinking about our reten recruitment and retention plan? You know, do we have an actual strategy that takes into consideration how things have changed? Do we have protective language in our contracts to deal with this to allow us to appropriately and in good faith negotiate with our providers and have this conversation? Or could they say, you know what, I'm holding you to the contract from that standpoint. And, you know, when the contract's up, I'll walk because there's definitely physicians who are in that position now, right? So how do we plan for the future from that standpoint? Part of it is, is having consistent education with providers as to changes as they are happening, okay? You have to have that engagement now. And then how are you aligned with your providers? I like compensation structures that are simple and easy to understand that are well aligned with our overall organizational position and strategy. If the physicians understand and are part of the decision-making progress about organizational strategy and can directly see how their remuneration fits into that strategy, you will go much further than if it's all done in separate bubbles, right? Here's, you know, non-physicians came up with a strategy, it's directive and it's handed down, and oh wait, here's a very overly complex that has been lawyered all over it with all this legalese and nobody can calculate how they're gonna get paid. To me, that's setting yourself up for failure from that standpoint. Understand where you are when it comes to this population health initiative. Are you all fee for service? Have you put, dipped your toe into the pool of value base? Are you waiting in it in a fully into at risk contract? Don't pay for what you don't get paid for, but understand where is your organization and your compensation should be following it. And I do say following it in the sense of the first time that the organization experienced something at risk is not the first time that the physician should be at risk in their compensation. You have to engage with them as to what can they individually impact. If they can't have an impact on something, should they be at risk for it? So part of it is getting the different metrics and pieces in place on the larger organizational scale, creating rewards and benefits for providers for participating, you know, initially. And as the organization shifts to risk, so should the provider compensation follow. Usually, I would say best practice is about two to three years after the organization does. So if, but frankly, you can accelerate that the more attuned you are to actually having your providers engage with something. So if you're thinking about joining an ACO, do your providers know it? Where are your providers in that decision making? If the providers are well attuned to an, the organizational strategy to moving towards value base, and they see how it impacts the organization financially, you can accelerate the process of tying their compensation to that similar acceleration path. But also pay attention to what's going on with your competition. You know, what do your physicians expect from their compensation standpoint? Know whether or not your physicians are talking to other physicians in the area or across the country. Don't be surprised when your physician comes and says, my friend pulled it up on MGMA or Sullivan Cotter and they said, you know, national is this. If you are well versed into what is going on in your market, you're better equipped to have those conversations with the providers as opposed to why you may be paying differently. There's, you know, we do a lot of help with the recruitment for rural and small community hospitals associated with their provider compensation and recruitment. And one of the things we pay attention to are frankly the stuff that um, are not in kind cash compensation, they're not reflected in surveys. It might be, hey, our organization is helping yourself get a job as well. You know, making sure that you are, you know, what are the benefits of living in this community? We have to, you know, play up the things that work well. We might, because we want you to have a better call cover, um, call rotation where we are on a one and three instead of a one and two, we have three of you guys working instead of, frankly, the market demand might be for only two. 
and that was perfectly financially reasonable versus, you know, the call burden that's reflected in that survey, frankly, might be one in six. So understanding all those pieces allows you to have these meaningful conversations with your physician so that you can increase that engagement. You know, absolutely key. If you think about, you know, talking about where we are compared to other organizations, we talked about how it moves across the spectrum, going from base to salary all the way to at-risk performance incentive compensation. For the most part, most of us are still here at the beginning. We're so used to, here's your base salary, plus you get an incentive bonus for hitting this threshold or this number of visits. And then you have benefit, and then you might have your benefits package. Realizing where you are on that spectrum can tell you where you can go and engaging with the physicians about what the future looks like. So understanding here's the next piece of it. And if you're not to quality incentive yet, that might be the next thing you tackle. But you need to go through these steps. You don't jump from the first section of just base salary, full blown overnight to at risk performance incentive compensation, unless you want to blow up your medical staff which I don't recommend. So what do you do from here, right? I, I'm sure people are sick of this and thinking about washing their hands all the time. Hopefully it's become second nature with regards to COVID for people who weren't doing it beforehand. The same applies to your compliance issues, right? When it comes to your contract, it's just like hand washing. Just make it part of your routine so that you don't have those nightmare penalties of four plus million dollars for a technical error, right? Just like you didn't want to catch COVID, you don't want to catch CMS or start violations. Pay attention to what's in your contracts. Have that good documentation. Make sure your contracts are being executed the way that they're actually written. Uh, Kirsten and I were on the phone yesterday, or on Tuesday, with an organization where we were talking about their compensation. We were finding out about all these provisions that weren't in the contract. They were like, well, we pay them for this. And then we also pay them from their chronic care management. We pay them for admissions for into the hospital from that standpoint. And none of that was in the contract. And I have to say, we encounter that with almost every single client. We find at least one piece of compensation that's nowhere to be found in the contract. So if that sounds crazy to you, I still would suggest go back and look at what's going on in your own organization because you might be surprised that there's compensation that's being paid that you didn't even realize. This is why it ends up all over the place on the PNL from that standpoint. Create a policy. Create what your cadence is. How frequently are we going to review this? Is it twice a year? At least once a year, I would hope, you know, to make sure that we, we cover ourselves from that standpoint. Just like you know, hey, every single I step, you know, step in the door, I'm washing my hands. Every single time, you know, I'm reviewing this part of the PNL, I'm reviewing the contract. All right. And then, then of course, you know, we have a little decision to tree for some of the things we've been going over. You know, when it's, are you dealing with just the CMS changes? How, how should you go about it, right? How far can you kick the can, can down the road? What should you adopt? What should you not be able to adopt? Do you have the protective language? If yes, then, you know, you just make sure you're renegotiating their contracts accordingly. If not, maybe you need to have your contracts looked at and amended. And the biggest one I would say is, do you have a strategy, right? Do you have a strategy that is developed directly related to what your organizational goals are now and where they are going in the future? And how frequently are you going to be examining those to make sure you're still in line with that? So I know we're just about at time. I know that this has been a lot of information for people to digest. If you have questions, um, we'll go ahead and use about a minute um, that we have remaining. If people want to ask some questions, I believe we have a chat feature for people to um, send, it, uh, send in your questions. But in addition to that, here is uh, making sure you have Kirsten and my contact information for questions that might come up or anything else that we have talked about that might have resonated, especially with regards to, I'm really excited to have Kirsten part of the team now and bringing in her benefits expertise, because I think that's something that people we're not expecting to pay attention to when they think about physician compensation. Well, thank you very much, Opal. And I don't see any questions in the question box at the moment or in the chat section, but if anybody has any questions they want to ask now, feel free to type them in. This is a fairly large group, so we can't easily open up the microphones for everybody, but uh, feel free to type things in. 
or I see, and we'll go from there. Great. Well, thank you, Benson. And we um, it does look like we are at time today. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hopefully, we touch on information that was helpful to you. And have a great afternoon.